once you get to the intermediate stage of rehabilitation, so it could be anything from day five to week eight to 10, if it's maybe post-surgical or post-ACL injury, for example. And we do things such as neuroplastic training, which means we get the sportsmen to look in a, in a mirror so that they get overflow and feedback. We might use video analysis. We might use a metronome. So they work to, a, they can listen to the metronome so they get a rhythm. But we try and get that motor cortex to be involved in the rehabilitation. And as that's been shown to speed up recovery. We'll obviously look at flexibility and use the correct exercises to improve flexibility of the correct muscles. And the only way we know which are the correct muscles to stretch is because we've done our testing in the objective phase. So we know, say, from Thomas's test that his right psoas is very short and her left psoas is very long. So we'll only um, stretch out the right psoas and we'll do inner range strengthening of the left psoas. So we want to be prescriptive on that athlete. We will at this stage do strength and endurance training. We might move from isometrics to isotonics and different types of resistance. And we'll start doing balance and proprioception exercises, maybe standing on one leg, eyes closed, standing on an uneven surface or a bozu ball, those type of things to progress that um, proprioceptive challenge. So I've sort of put some examples here. So this would be the sort of thing you might do in the intermediate phase for something with a hamstring tendinopathy. So the reason I chose this is that in a hamstring tendinopathy, your injury is at the origin of the hamstring as it attaches onto the ischial tuberosity. Now, this is usually occurs with sprinting or anything that involves hip flexion. So deadlifts, so where you fle over flexing, those cause hamstring tendinopathies, for example. So in the intermediate phase of rehabilitation of a, somebody with hamstring tendon pain, you obviously can't put them into hip flexion because that will cause compression of the hamstring tendon onto the ischial tuberosity and irritate it. So you wanna start your rehabilitation with high load possibly, but without hip flexion. So you can do bridging because that's in hip extension. So you're getting the hamstring, but you're not overloading the tendon. Here we're getting some ab work, but we're not over flexing. So we're not over um, compressing the tendon on the ischial tuberosity. Obviously we can do abduction and extension because again, we're not flexing the hip. There's our abduction. Well, again, the shin lift, not the clam. And then we can do into hip extension again. This is, I call this the, um, Jane Fonda, but basically you're getting it, or a fire hydrant, you're getting an abduction external rotation using a resistance band, but you're not bringing that hip into flexion. And so you're giving strengthening without irritation. I'm just going to pause because I see I've got two questions. Um, uh, doctor, do you want to uh, take the questions uh, at the end of the session? Uh, let's take these two now while we're on this section, perhaps, I think, if that's okay. Um, okay, perfect. Instability we can confirm only by objective evaluation. So instability you will pick up in a couple of ways. So first of all, you want to pick up in your questioning um, if they're generally hypermobile. So you will pick that up. They could have EDS which is very common, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, for example. So you will also see how they sit and move. Somebody who's generally hypermobile often wiggles and sits, crosses their legs, winds themselves up, and is you can see them kind of twisting and torsioning to try and give themselves some sort of stability. Often if they stand, they kind of wiggle around and move because it's uncomfortable to stand in a stable position. And then you build that up by testing, doing the Baton's scale, which is out of nine. And that way you can tell for their hyperlaxity. And then you ask them questions related to this, such as um, if you have a um, Marcane injection in the mouth from a dentist, does it work or doesn't it? And often hypermobile people will say to you, flip, it never works. Or the dentist has to give me more. They often, for example, have very elastic skin, they can have, uh, there's so many symptoms, but
but they can have a history of bladder infections as a child, for example. So that's your first indication of laxity. Then based on that, you know there's more likely that they could have recurrent injuries and, and have an instability. So that's the first way you'll, man, you'll assess that. Then obviously your objective examination, yes, you will pick up instability um, with your specific tests, such as um, apprehension test at the shoulder, your Lachman's test at the knee, uh, anterior draw at the ankle and so on. So there, and there are specific tests that will help you with that. Um, so that's sort of the way you would go from a clinical, clinical um, assessment, obviously. Okay, and the next question is, what oh, is the most... Yeah. Yes, no, you go. Yes, no, no, there no. you go. So uh, what is the most suitable time to initiate strengthening exercise in rotator cuff injury? Do we need to wait for the pain to completely resolve before it is in general? Okay, so thank you for that question, Vivek. That's a good question. So, um, so current research is promoting that we need to start rehabilitation as soon as possible. So sometimes rehabilitation can be can reduce the pain. So um, we want to initiate strengthening exercises that ease the symptoms as soon as possible. But the key is not to aggravate. So often I'll say to the patient that we can do whatever exercises we do, if it's a tendon for the shoulder or the upper area, we want no more than a one out of two out of 10 pain. And it must be no worse at 24 hours afterwards. So if the patient says to you, Flip, I did those exercises and I'm so much more sore the next day, then we have overloaded that patient or done too much. So we use pain as our guide and our friend, as opposed to being scared of it. So pain will guide us as to, to make sure that we are, is a lovely word, titrate, that we titrate up our loading and our exercise optimally. So for a shoulder with a rotator cuff injury, for example, you will start ideally with isometric exercise in neutral. So you might be doing isometric abduction into a wall, isometric flexion with the fist into the wall, isometric external rotation with the opposite hand, pushing the hand into the belly to get the isometric internal rotation, and that type of thing, pushing backwards into a, a, a bed to get the triceps, for example. So start those isometrics because they are so analgesic that they can really help to control and manage the, um, the symptoms. So um, I have a, a rule in my practices is that no patient leaves without at least one exercise. So even in the early phase, there'll be something to help them manage their symptoms so that they feel empowered. And that might also improve putting them in a sling in the short term or icing it. Um, but certainly you will always start. But one of the things you probably will do is you will avoid anything over 90 degrees in the acute or even intermediate phases because most shoulder injuries are aggravated by overhead activities. Um, I always say no one gets injured watching Netflix. So if you do your um, exercises in a neutral position, you'll often um, have a good outcome. Okay. Um, there's any other question? Yeah. yeah if there is any pseudo laxity in evaluation. So I'm not sure what you mean by pseudo laxity, but I think I've answered that question based on the hypermobility um, component from the first question. Um, so I think I have answered that because in my experience, in fact, in my rooms, I think 70% of my patients are hypermobile. I think it's one of the main things that we miss. And hypermobile patients can be misdiagnosed and misunderstood because, and often um, thought to have psychosocial issues because they're always sore um, and they might be, um, and I think it's very important that every single patient that comes into your rooms is always assessed for um, hypermobility or perhaps what you're calling hyperlaxity. Uh, kindly recommend us a best sports rehabilitation book. Uh, Flip, I would actually recommend my software because if you go online, all these exercises are there so you can start to learn the rehabilitation and there are instructions there for you. From a book perspective, sadly, 
Um, I use articles far more than books. Um, uh, Bruckner and Kahn is probably your most comprehensive general sports rehabilitation book that I can think of. But unfortunately, you have to troll um, the internet quite a lot. Okay, so I'll stop the questions for now. Thank you for those. Okay, so we've gone through hamstring tendinopathy here. And stubbornness. There we go. So let's look at late rehabilitation. So the principles of late rehabilitation. So this could be anything from day one to six to 12 months post-injury. So it could be post-op, uh, could be after rotator cuff repair, going back into a thrower, um, could be um, an international level swimmer after a um, slap lesion or a biceps, severe biceps lesion. Um, so also, or maybe somebody after an arthroscopy for a labral repair in the hip. And you want to get them back into pre-injury con condition and to resume sports specific activities. So we look at power, return to sport has to be functional. We really look at our biomechanical loading patterns. We look at agility and speed. And we want to then ultimately try and push them to replicate the fatigue of competition. So don't just look at them in the rooms and go, okay, you're ready to go back to sport. You've actually got to try and replicate it. So if they're swimming, you've got to put them in the pool and see can they, how many laps can they swim without symptoms and then try and use that as your comparable sign. So we start to do more, far more functional loading. So there I've got a, a, I love this exercise, the bird dog, where you've got resistance with the um, TheraBand. Here we're doing a Bulgarian squat with one weight. We're doing what I call the Amandla, which is a step up using a weight. So a nice kinetic energy functional exercise that you would use for foot, knee, hip, back, shoulder, elbow type of injuries, because it really does um, address all of those systems. These are obviously very high load, the side plank in the abduction position. You can choose some sort of um, weapon, I always call it, so a piece of apparatus to increase that loading and make the exercises more challenging. So some of the principles with rehabilitation is often I'm asked, how do you make sure that you're not giving the patient too many exercises? What about the compliancy? Are they going to do the stuff? Um, first of all, you've got to dangle the right carrot to try and motivate them and educate them and give them advice so that they do the right exercise. So try and limit the exercises to four to six exercises a day, no more than 15 to 20 minutes of your program in order to, to improve their compliancy or their adherence to your program. If it's a tendon injury, try and avoid compressive or tensile loading. Remember that no change in pain is acceptable when you're doing a functional loading exercise. So if, for example, you are doing a um, step down off a step and they are developing knee pain, that's telling you that their biomechanics when they do that step down are not optimal. So if they do the step down correctly with the knee in line with the middle of the foot, they shouldn't have any symptoms. So there should be no pain when they perform that exercise. That pain is telling you they're doing the exercise incorrectly. So as again, as I said earlier, we allow pain of a one to a two out of 10 in the upper quarter and pain to a four out of 10 in the lower quarter. Um, we allow that pain during the exercises so long as there's no increase in pain over 24 hours. So it's not just pain during the exercise, but it's a, a cumulative um, pain over 24 hours. And so if they say to you the next day, they felt quite sore, you know you've overloaded them. So just to go back on that, if they say that they were sore at 24 hours, that doesn't mean that the exercise is wrong. It just means that you've done too much. So finding the right load is obviously very, very important. So you don't wanna overload them. Um, it doesn't mean that the exercise was wrong. It just might've meant that you've put in too much load too soon. So when we do our loading programs, we wanna be progressive. So we wanna start with stabilization or motor control, then we can move to strength and then we can move to power. And if you, as you move up this pyramid, 
the fewer days you will exercise. So once you get to power and you're loading, you may only do a gym program three days a week because the tendon and the muscle need to recover between. So when you start your program, you'll start with three sets of 15 reps. But as you progress up the pyramid, you will progress to, for example, three reps, three sets of only three reps. In other words, you're increasing the weight, but you're decreasing the rep. And that's actually the progression.